Hello, I'm Michael Brown, President of the School for Advanced Research. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual opening of Hostile Terrain 94, an exhibit that brings to light the tragic story of migrants who died trying to cross the Sonoran Desert of Arizona between the mid-1990s and 2019. It represents a major contribution to ongoing debates about the immigration policies of the United States. Hostile Terrain 94 was years in the making. It was created by Jason De Leon, SAR's 2013 Weatherhead Fellow, as well as his team at the Undocumented Migration Project, a nonprofit research, art, education, and media collective. Jason De Leon is Professor of Anthropology and Chicano Chicano Studies at UCLA. His interests include archaeology, ethnophotography, and forensic science. He received his doctorate from Penn State in 2008 and was named a MacArthur Fellow in 2017. We're honored to have been able to bring this project to Santa Fe for the launch of a global initiative that will end with the, ex the exhibit being hosted over 150 locations around the world. The Santa Fe installation is the result of a partnership between SAR, the Center for Contemporary Arts Santa Fe, and Site Santa Fe. I want to thank SAR's Board of Directors and our members for their support. If you're not already a member, we'd like to invite you to join us. Your membership supports programs like this one, as well as other events and programs that advance creative thought and honor Native American arts and cultural heritage. I'd also like to thank the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, which is supporting tomorrow's online conversation between Jason De Leon and another MacArthur Fellow, as well as SAR senior scholar, Stephen Feld. Their discussion will explore how scholars through projects like this one are working to translate social science research into more accessible formats for the general public. If you haven't registered for this event, you can go to our website, sarweb.org, for additional information on how to register. I hope you stay with us at the end of the event to join a live Q&A with Jason. Now I'll do a handoff to Irene Hoffman, Director and Chief Curator of Site Santa Fe. Thank you, Michael. On behalf of all of us at Site Santa Fe, I would like to welcome you. I want to acknowledge the significant and powerful work of Jason De Leon, and I want to thank our collaborators at SAR and CCA for this special opportunity to work together to bring Jason's important project and all its related programs to our audiences here in Santa Fe and beyond. Hostile Terrain 94 is installed at site within a larger exhibition that explores the immigrant and refugee experience through the eyes of 11 contemporary artists from around the world. Displaced, contemporary artists explore the global refugee crisis, explores human migrations and displacements of the past, present, and future. Through works created in a range of media, artists from around the globe foreground forgotten histories and ask us to understand and confront the highest levels of human displacement on record. The exhibition poses critical questions around this global crisis and it illuminates the complexity surrounding the urgent social, political, and environmental issues that frame the circumstances of displacement. Hostile Terrain 94 bears witness to the refugee crisis on our own southern border, making visible the brutal reality that so many migrants face in search of a new life. Displaced and Hostile Terrain will be on view at site through the month of January, so we hope to see you here. Now, before we hear from Jason, I'd like to hand off to April Jouse, the Interim Director at the Center for Contemporary Arts, Santa Fe. Thank you, Irene. Hi, I'm April Jouse, Chief Administrative Officer for the Center for Contemporary Arts of Santa Fe, or CCA. We are pleased to join the School for Advanced Research, as well as Site Santa Fe, in presenting Beyond Borders, as well as conversations around immigration and migration with an emphasis on the U.S. border. As a part of this collaboration, CCA is presenting two documentaries with corresponding programs as a part of our online programming The Living Room series. The first is Border South. This film presents stories of migrants from Central America and the harsh challenges they face as they make their way north to the United States. Scheduled for July 24th at 7 p.m., Border South filmmaker Raul Opaz Pastrana will be joined by the film's producer and advisor, as well as the creator of the Hostile Terrain 94 exhibit, Jason De Leon, in an online discussion. 
the second is the Infiltrators, a winner of two awards at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival. This film is an inspiring story about a group of dreamers who end up in a for-profit detention center and work together from the inside to protect the detainees. Scheduled for Friday, August 7th at 7 p.m., the Infiltrators award-winning filmmakers Alex Rivera and Christina Ibarra will discuss their creation of their innovative and timely documentary. You are invited to view these films and register for their programs on the CCA website, ccasantafe.org. Again, CCA is happy to partner with Site Santa Fe and the School for Advanced Research to present these programs as a part of Beyond Borders. Before I get started, I just want to express my deepest gratitude to SAR, Site Santa Fe, and CCA Santa Fe. My staff and I could not have asked for more support both before and after the COVID-19 crisis. I know this is a difficult time for everyone and I'm just deeply appreciative of the fact that these organizations have worked so hard to keep this project going uh, and to help us launch this, um, this exhibition premiere. So thank you all so much and also thank you to everyone in Santa Fe who participated in the filling out of toe tags. Uh, and just supporting this project um, for a very, very long time. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about my relationship with Santa Fe in the Q&A, but I, I just want to let you all know that I'm thinking of you and it's a very special place and I'm so glad that we can have this uh, exhibition launching in, um, in my favorite place to, to live and work. Hello, my name is Jason DeLeon. And I am professor of anthropology and Chicana, Chicano and Central American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. I am also the executive director of the Undocumented Migration Project and head curator of the global participatory exhibition, Hostile Terrain 94. Today, I will talk about Hostile Terrain 94 and its premiere in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hostile Terrain 94, the exhibition, is part of a larger project called the Undocumented Migration Project which is a long-term anthropological research project that also combines uh, education and outreach to document and raise awareness about the experiences of clandestine migrants moving from Latin America to the United States. The Undocumented Immigration Project draws on a range of research tools, including ethnography, archaeology, photoethnography, forensic science, and a variety of other um, methodological uh, approaches. I'm going to talk before I get into the details about Hostile Terrain 94 I just want to give the viewers a little bit of background on undocumented migration both before and after the mid-1990s. Uh, just briefly prior to about 1993 undocumented migration typically happened in urban zones so downtown San Diego, El Paso, these were places where people could wait till the sun went down, uh, amass on the Mexican side, and as soon as it became dark, large groups of people would hop the fence and run into town and try to blend in with the local population, which is relatively easy in a place like El Paso or, or San Diego where you'd have a high uh, Latinx population. But this was something that um, was increasingly becoming difficult for politicians and the Border Patrol to explain away. I mean, people were literally watching migrants hop the fence in, in broad daylight and run into the United States. And so around 1993, the Border Patrol, first in El Paso and later in, in California, started to amass um, large numbers of agents and vehicles, and helicopters and surveillance cameras in and around urban ports of entry, places where historically people were hopping the fence and and now the border patrol decides through a show of force that they can stop people from hopping the fence in those places and potentially force them to try to cross the border in some other location whether it's um you know you know you know five or six miles east of east or west of these of these uh, urban zones where people can now they can hop the fence and there's no one around but they have to double back now to get back into a an urban zone where they can they can blend in with the population, which then also makes them uh, easier to spot by the border patrol. 
And so we start doing this um, in the mid 1990s unofficially. And the show of force in these urban zones, it doesn't actually stop migration. It just redirects uh, the flow to these to these um, depopulated areas. Um, but it gets the the border crossings away from public view, which politicians and, and the Border Patrol both um, like because it then gives off the impression that they are somehow stopping this flow of people, even though they are not. And so we, we start to redirect them away from uh, uh, these urban zones and out into the wilderness. In 1994, they become formalized across the entire U.S.-Mexico border and uh, begin begin to be referred to as a policy called prevention through deterrence. Prevention through deterrence was outlined in 1994 in a, a federal document called the Border Patrol Strategic Plan. And it's a very, it, it recognizes that the U.S.-Mexico border cuts across some very um, difficult to traverse landscapes. So mountains, deserts, lakes, rivers, places where you can, um, die of dehydration in the summer for lack of water and because of intense heat. You can die from um, freezing to death in the winter in places like the the, um, the mountains of, of San Diego or mountains of, of southern Arizona. Uh, but basically the Border Patrol recognizes that these uh, these landscapes could become impediments to the movement of people. And the policy that's put into place, prevention through deterrence, operates on this logic that if you push people away from urban zones and towards these more difficult to cross landscapes, that you can disrupt the movement of people uh, and you can force them over what they call, quote, hostile terrain. So mountains, deserts, etc. And they view these mountains and deserts as uh, an asset to the Border Patrol because it takes a lot of, of human energy, um, ingenuity, and luck to, to make it across these barren landscapes. And so this was put into place in 1994 officially, and this is still our current security paradigm. We force people away from urban zones and make the path of least resistance to be these depopulated areas where it's assumed if you have to walk five days across a barren uh, desert with temperatures in the, in the, in the hundreds, uh, in the low hundreds, that you will be easier to catch because you'll either be exhausted or you will be dead. And so this was put into place in 94 and has been the policy for a very, very long time. For, for, for a couple of decades, the Southern Arizona desert, the Sonora desert has been one of these places where people have been funneled towards or, or pushed away from urban zones toward these deserts. And just to give you a sense of the numbers prior to prevention through deterrence, you maybe had, 20,000 or less apprehensions in Southern Arizona in, every, in any given year. Once prevention through deterrence is put into place, you now have um, hundreds of thousands of people coming through the Sonora Desert, um, and what Border Patrol referred to as the Tucson sector. So these, this map here is referencing these different Border Patrol jurisdictions. But the Tucson sector for the longest time had been the, um, the most trafficked um, part of the US-Mexico border. Uh, between the sort of late 1990s and around 2015, you had over 5 million people who had been apprehended in this area, in this desert. So you could imagine you're taking the population of Houston, Texas, and then funneling them through this um, vast desert landscape. And if you go to the Sonora Desert today, you will see that we don't have a border wall in most places because the terrain is so rugged and it's incredibly expensive and um, logistically quite difficult to maintain a border wall in these locations. And you also don't have enough agents to sit at these walls to catch people as soon as they uh, hop the fence or, or, or go underneath it. So in many places, the border wall simply drops off. This image here is from the port of entry called Sasabe in Southern Arizona that has a border wall that extends about three to four miles in each direction and then stops. And people just walk to the end of this and then are able to, to, to walk into the United States um, with, with relative ease. Now, the issue is once you get around this, this border fence, you have to walk across uh, a depopulated, rugged landscape that has extreme temperatures, has more 
species of rattlesnakes than anywhere else in the Western Hemisphere. Um, it's got rugged mountains that have to be crossed. Uh, there's very little water available. This is a difficult environment to survive in. And folks who are attempting to walk from uh, a place like Sasabe to, um, to a town like Tucson or Phoenix will find themselves having to walk for five, six, seven, sometimes two weeks across this desert. And um, it is a very, very challenging activity and it's one that has um, injured and led to the deaths of, of many people. At the numbers of deaths that happened around the time of prevention through deterrence in 1993, you'll notice that you go from having just a few you know, under 100 deaths across the entire U.S.-Mexico border in a given year to suddenly now uh, hundreds of deaths a year occurring in places like southern Arizona. And something to keep in mind as well is the Border Patrol implements this plan in 93, makes it official in 1994, which is also the same year as the North American Free Trade Agreement. So we end up crashing Mexico's economy through the, the free trade of American subsidies like uh, like corn, which floods the Mexican market with a cheap product, and now suddenly you have Mexican peasant farmers who can't compete with U.S. prices, and so you now have an, uh, a group of impoverished farmers who have to flee Mexico in search of a living wage in the United States. So we change our border patrol strategy in '94. We start to make it more difficult and deadly, and then at the same time we. Uh, we make it difficult for people in Mexico to actually make a living wage. And so you have this out migration that corresponds at the same time as this change in border patrol policy, which now suddenly hundreds of people are dying um, on, an, on an annual basis, if not more. If you look at for Southern Arizona alone, you've got around 3,200 recovered bodies between 2000 and, 2000, and early 2020. Uh, we do think that these numbers are low. Um, that many people die in the Arizona desert and their bodies are never recovered, either because they die in remote locations where no one is looking for them, or because the environment uh, destroys their bodies before they can be recovered. And I would be happy to talk about the forensic aspects of our work and what we know about migrant death in the desert during the Q&A. give you another sense of what this looks like um, from the perspective of, of policymakers, in 1997, the Border Patrol decided that they were going to try to evaluate the efficacy of prevention through deterrence. And it was recognized very early on that this policy would lead to an increase in migrant death. And to the point that policymakers at one point were using a metric of an increase in migrant deaths as a way to measure whether or not this policy was effective. And so they definitely saw it went into place, you had a, a, a less than 50 deaths a year, and now suddenly this policy is in place and you have hundreds of deaths a year. Um, this has been noted numerous times. Um, it is not uh, uh, an indirect outcome of this policy. It was noted quite early on that forcing people over hostile terrain would in fact lead to, um, to more fatalities. But the thinking had been that if enough people died early on, that this policy then would be successful and people would be deterred from crossing because they thought it was too dangerous. But of course, this has not been the case, and uh, the risk of death, it seems, is in many ways no match for the, um, the desperation that, that poverty, um, violence in home countries can, um, can, can have on people's decisions to out-migrate. But I would argue in general that these policies represent a, a very callous approach to the lives of migrants, and in many ways, we think about migrant deaths as being unfortunately expendable. To give you a sense of what it looks like in southern Arizona, this is a map of about 3,200 migrant deaths um, collected by the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner. And these deaths occur in the, from the late 80s up until early 2020, but the bulk of these happen in the late 90s up until, up until now. Um, you know, Arizona, this part of Arizona, the, the Sonora Desert, has become a, a killing field for, for migrants. And this is something that, that I have been long committed to, to raising awareness about. And so these deaths that people oftentimes don't, um, don't know much about um, are the focus of our global exhibition, Terrain, 
94. Now to give you a little bit of uh, background about Hostile Terrain 94, it came about um, because I, I had been interested in creating a an exhibition that would highlight what I consider to be a, a, a human rights crisis. And so in the fall of 2018, we put together an exhibition in Portland, Maine, at the Maine, um, uh, the Institute for Contemporary Art at the Maine College of Arts. And one of the elements in that particular show was a wall graphic printed on vinyl of all of these red, red dots. And I thought that if we map this out on the wall, that the audience members would get a real sense of the of the tragedy of this and the gravity of of migrant death but what ended up happening was i think these dots really did not have the the effect that i that i wanted them to it was missing some context and it just i, I think people were were getting lost in the graphic itself and not really understanding um that each one of these dots represented a life and so i guess it, it really kind of came to me in a dream one night. I woke up in the middle of the night and I said to myself, what if we replaced these red dots on a wall with uh, handwritten toe tags? What if we took all this information from the medical examiner's office and we, we hand wrote them out on the tags so we could include things like name, age, um, uh, cause of death, the condition of death, and the exact location of where those deaths uh, occurred? What if we wrote out these names and onto tags and then mounted them in the exact location of where those those bodies were found and we would color code them so the orange would represent the unidentified bodies and we have about 1300 unidentified migrant bodies currently in this database and then the manila would represent those bodies that have names attached to them so we had a, a follow-up show in the early winter of 2019 at the phillips uh, museum of art at uh, Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, PA, where we replaced these red dots, the red dots on that previous map with these tags. Um, and I had mine, at, when I was still teaching at the University of Michigan, I had students hand fill out all of this information. And it took, it took six students a couple of months to fill out the, the 3,200 toe tags. But what happened in the middle of this whole process of rethinking this exhibition, the students started coming to me saying, you know, it's really difficult to to fill out these tags, to sit down for an hour and write out the names of the dead. It's it's emotionally challenging. Um, it's 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 exhausting. It's um, you know, it, it makes you sit with the names and with the dead in a different kind of way. And so I had another dream. I said, okay, well, what if we do a follow up exhibition or set of exhibitions after this this sort of first round? And instead of us building a, a toe tag wall in a gallery space and people can come and look at it, what if instead of that, we partnered with communities around the globe and we said, we will give you all the information and the tags and instructions on how to do it, but then you have to mobilize your own communities to fill out these tags. And you would fill out these tags and you would take the information, the location information represented here on this map and you would build your own your own version of it you would mount each of these in the exact location and and i decided that we would try to do this um in a very um kind of low budget way so we would have a very low overhead for the exhibition fee it would be about fifteen hundred dollars which would include all of the materials instructions supplementary um, content as well as um, staff support from our team. And we will just try to partner with people in different places to see what they can come up with. And so we built a website in January of 2019 and then sent out requests for people who, who wanted to collaborate with us. And immediately we had dozens of, uh, of community partners ar around the globe. And so this project really started started building um, building steam. And initially, my thinking was we would do this in 94 locations around the globe, 94 being uh, a nod to the year that this policy begins. Uh, but it became clear early on that we had way more than 94 hosts who were interested. And so we pushed that number to, to 150. 
and um, we still may get there. I'll talk about that more probably in, in the Q&A, but we're right now at over 130 confirmed hosts on, on six continents who will all build these maps by hand with their community groups. So they will mobilize hundreds if not thousands of people in each location to fill out toe tags and then to construct these wall maps. In addition to giving folks the, the toe tags and this information, we've also designed other um, uh, complementary components to the show that I'll just show some, some quick previews here. We have a, a, a virtual or augmented reality component that can be accessed through a cell phone. So you can go up to the wall and with a cell phone app, you can engage with the wall and hear stories about migrants or get more information through this, this augmented reality map. Um, so I'll show you just a, a quick quick preview here of a couple of different elements. Caminamos muchas, muchos días, pero llegamos bien, gracias a Dios. Muchas veces me agarraron, pero pues yo traté lo mismo de regresar para acá a Estados Unidos. And here is uh, another example from the augmented reality. Since prevention through deterrence was put in place in the early 90s, migrant deaths at the border have increased drastically. By selectively blocking migration, those who make this journey are forced to risk their lives, and the effects of this policy are felt around the globe. Families are shackled with debt from their relatives' passage and stricken with worry about their loved ones who may never return. So those are just a couple of um, examples from, from the prototype, and uh, you'll be able to access a lot of this stuff online as well. Um, but once people are able to visit the, the physical exhibition, you'll be able to um, to see the, the, the finalized versions of those. And for and for me, it's very important to add as much context to this um, to this piece as possible, um, especially the the voices of migrants themselves. And so in, in, in as many ways as possible, we want to include um, the direct uh, voices of those who have gone through this, this experience. One of the things that's um, for me as a, um, as, a, as a curator is each one of our shows is gonna be different. Um, so the 130 shows that are happening all over the place, um, there's different, each space has its own kind of unique flavor, um, and depending on um, on the space and on logistical support, we've been able to to augment the show with with additional material, so um, audio, video, uh, objects left by migrants, uh, and one of the things that you'll see in Santa Fe um, are the photographs of my longtime collaborator Michael Wells, who has been photographing undocumented migration with us since 2009. And so many of his photos will be on display in Santa Fe for, for viewing and um, has been a, a crucial part of this, um, of the, the undocumented migration project since its beginning and has been there with me in Northern Mexico, Southern Mexico, in migrant shelters, in the homes of migrants in New York and California, in Ecuador, and has just been trying to document the uh, the experiences of, of people, as well as the material culture that is left behind during this uh, archeological, what I would consider to be an archeological process. So people are migrating across the Sonora Desert of Arizona, and like every great human migration, they have been leaving things behind. And for for over a decade now, we have been collecting and documenting the water bottles, the backpacks, the clothes, the personal items that migrants have left in the desert as a, an archeological collection of, of this history, of this very important history. And um, I'm proud to say that, you know, the photographs that Mike has, has taken of these objects, um, you know, represent a moment in time that has been lost in a lot of ways because much of these materials are are ephemeral. They get destroyed by the environment. They get picked up by conservation groups and thrown away, but they definitely will not last forever out in the Arizona desert. And so much of our work has tried to um, conserve and, and salvage these materials for, um, for, for our history into the future. 
And if you go to, um, like right now, if you go to the American History Museum, the Smithsonian, you will see numerous objects from our project that are on display there. And for me, um, that was an important recognition that these objects that migrants have left behind represent an important part of American history. It's a highly politicized and potentially unpopular um, moment in history for some people, but it's history nonetheless. And so, you know, our work has been to, to document and to conserve, but also to raise awareness, especially about things like migrant death. And so here is a photograph that Mike took in 2011 of uh, a human tooth that we found on a trail where um, a fragmented skeleton had been found a, a few weeks prior, and Mike and I had gone back to try to locate the skull of this individual, but unfortunately were only able to find uh, a, a few teeth. And this particular person is still, uh, unfortunately, unidentified. So what you're seeing in Santa Fe is both the, the, the physical wall of the toe tags, um, the augmented reality, as well as, as photographs and, and some objects that, um, that have, been, have been collected. And we have been working on this since January of 2019. So we're going on about 18 months of trying to develop uh, all of the logistics, the, the different approaches that we want to take with our hosting partners so that we can be successful in launching you know, an exhibition on, on six continents. And so what we've done, we have a, a small team, um, and I want to give thanks to our, our project manager, Austin Shipman, as well as our two exhibition liaisons, Gabe Cantor and Nicole Smith, who have been working diligently for, for the, the last year and a half to, uh, to collaborate with our hosting partners around the globe. And we've done a whole series of prototype exhibitions where we've partnered with people in Southern California, New York, uh, Ireland. Uh, we've, we've launched about eight prototypes uh, over the last uh, 12 months where we've been trying to fine tune you know, the logistics of how do you organize hundreds of people to build this um, incredibly time-consuming exhibition that requires a lot of patience and, um, um, and a real commitment to detail? How does one do that remotely? Um, you know, because most of our team, you know, we're not going to be in these places where these exhibitions are going to be built. And so we have just had lots and lots of Zoom meetings with our partners trying to figure out all of the different issues that might come up. Um, everything from how to ship a kit to, you know, uh, ship it abroad, get, have, get it through customs, how to translate it into multiple languages, how to provide enough context for people in, you know, Berlin or Australia or the Philippines so they can understand what it is they're doing. But then also, how do we create a real partnership with those um, with, with those communities? Um, or for, and I'm very proud to say that with all of our hosting partners around the globe, we have been firmly committed to allowing them to, to do whatever it is they want to do in their community to help people make sense of migrant death in Arizona, as well as the, the broader issue of migration. You know, so these communities that are far removed from um, the U.S.-Mexico border are facing their own immigration crises, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in um, South America or Central Mexico or... Um, or Central America, the, the Mediterranean, uh, all of these places are struggling with, these, with this global issue of migration. And um, we have just been very open to saying, okay, here, here's the equipment, here's the, um, the instructions, and then you tell us how we can best facilitate your community feeling like they've taken some ownership of these issues. And so it's been really wonderful to see communities around the globe connecting it to local issues. And so our first global launch had been slated to be in the Mediterranean on the tiny island of Lampedusa in Italy, which is the first jumping off point for refugees fleeing uh, North Africa by boat. Uh, you know, obviously COVID-19 has put a damper on all of these plans, but we still an anticipate launching these shows starting in the winter of 2021 um, in all these locations. 
but we see a place like Lampedusa as being crucial for us showing the connections between what's happening in Arizona to what's happening in the Mediterranean. And we will be working with refugees who are being uh, uh, detained in Lampedusa to help build some of these, uh, um, uh, some of that exhibition there. But we'll be working with refugee um, and immigrant communities uh, all over the U.S., um, all over Europe, and elsewhere to partner so that they can come in and they can say, you know, this is a U.S.-Mexico border issue, but it's also, uh, you know, it's also a, a Eastern European issue, a Western European issue, an Australian issue. And it's been really cool to see artists come together in these places to to add materials to the to the wall, people recording their own testimonials about their family histories, um, about how migration impacts their local communities. And I would encourage any of you who are interested in this issue, it's not too late to get involved. Um, we are launching a whole bunch of shows probably near you if you are calling in from, from outside of, of New Mexico. Um, and we, we see a lot of potential for collaboration and really uh, these, these fulfilling, enriching community um, collaborations that we are completely open to. So those of you who are interested in, in getting involved, it's not too late and please uh, just contact us through our website, which I'll, I'll post in a second. Those of you that are interested can participate in what we are calling uh, a moment of global remembrance. And what this involves is asking 3,200 individual volunteers to submit to us a 20 second video of them reading out the names of the dead. And um, I would encourage you, if you're interested in participating, to, to go to our website, hostileterrain94.org, to get more information uh, and, and, and just be a part of this, of this moment of, of recognition of those who have lost their lives in search of a better one. And for me, I think that there is power in saying the names of the dead and remembering them, even if it's only for 20 seconds. Um, we really want to keep this issue alive and we are looking to our volunteers to help us raise awareness about, about this. And so I'm just gonna play a, a quick clip to give you an example of what, what this global um, virtual moment of remembrance looks like. Name, Felix Raimundo Escalante Aguirre, age 41. Reporting date, 2510. Cause of death, exposure. Elsa Santillan Garcia, age 37. Reporting date, July 13th, 2013. Cause of death undetermined. Name, Efran Castillo Ramirez, age 49. Reporting date, August 27, 2003. Cause of death, exposure. Name, Veronica Duenas Ramirez, age 33. Reporting date, 7-26-2004. Cause of death, drowning. Um, and so last but not least, um, I just want to conclude by... by talking a little bit about how you can get involved in this issue. Um, I think first and foremost is, is just voting. Um, you know, thinking about immigration and immigrant rights when you go to the ballot box is really important, especially in this year. Um, the day that I'm recording this, we've just heard that DACA um, will be protected by the Supreme Court. Um, which was not something I was expecting to happen this year. I was expecting quite the opposite. And so um, it maybe it does feel that um, that we're in a, a, an important political moment where we actually can do some good and, and protect people and, um, and start thinking about how we can move forward in a positive and productive way in society where, where all people are um, are taken into consideration when we when we start to formulate laws and think about um, those who need protection the most. Um, so number one, you know, just going to the to the, the ballot box this fall, and 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 keep immigrants and and, and migrant rights and, and human rights uh, in, uh, in into consideration when you when you vote. Uh, but along with that, I would strongly encourage you if you're interested 
to get educated. I think um, learning more about this issue is crucial and not just what you're going to learn in this current kind of news cycle. Uh, you know, immigration comes and goes depending on the season, depending on the year. Um, you know, election years tend to, to bring up migration issues more often than not. But this is something that happens 24 hours a day, all day long, and it's not going away anytime soon. And so I think one of the most important things you, one can do is to go out and, and get educated about this issue and think about it not just in terms of a U.S.-Mexico issue or an Arizona issue or increasingly a New Mexico issue. Uh, we know that New Mexico is now becoming a hot spot for migration as people are being pushed away from Texas and in Arizona. Um, you know, the last couple of years you've had um, two high profile cases regarding children from, from Guatemala who have died while crossing through New Mexico. Um, this issue is, is starting to affect everybody and, um, and it's, it is, it's happening on a global level. Uh, increased political instability in places like Central America, um, the effects of human-induced climate change, which are making certain um, places un, uninhabitable for people, are going to lead to to in increasing migration into the future. Um, poverty and violence, as it's, it's, it's being experienced globally, we know those are, are push factors that are sending people um, away from their home countries. And so learning about these things is, is going to be important as we move forward. And I just wanted to give you a couple of places to begin if you're interested in this Arizona issue or the things that I've talked about today. Uh, Radio Lab a couple of years ago did a three-part series called the Border Trilogy, which is all about the U.S.-Mexico border um, with a heavy emphasis on Arizona and on the work of the Undocumented Migration Project. And so much of what I've spoken about today you can learn about in more detail through that podcast. Um, you can also look at my 2015 book, The Land of Open Graves, published by the University of California Press, featuring photos by my collaborator, Michael Wells. Um, that book is heavily featured in the Radiolab uh, uh, podcast, but also you know, will give you uh, much more detail about the history of prevention through deterrence, what goes on in Southern Arizona, and the devastating impact that that policy has on the lives of, of migrants as well as their families. And so um, that's something you can check out. You can easily find that book on, uh, on Amazon and, and other locations where you buy uh, books virtually, in, at least in, in this moment. You can also go to our website if you're interested in supporting um, our project and our outreach and our many um, educational initiatives. Uh, UndocumentedMigrationProject.org is a place where you can learn more about us. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, so you can make a tax-deductible donation that could support um, our educational outreach, our exhibition work, uh, and our research work. And finally, you can go to our exhibition website, hostileterrain94.org, to learn more about this project and how you can get involved or bring it to your community. So that's it for me. I want to thank you all for listening, and I look forward to speaking with you more during the Q&A. Thank you. All right, while we're waiting for Jason to uh, unmute his camera, hello, Jason. Um, just want to mention that we've got about 20 minutes left, so we probably won't be able to take all of your questions. Um, but uh, if you can write them into the, um, you see there's a control panel on the right of your screen and there's a, a questions section and they'll be processed by a SAR staff member uh, and sent to me. I'll try and get to as many as I can uh, given the time that's available to us. Um, one question that's already come in, actually a couple have already come in, Jason. Um, first, thank you for that very powerful presentation. Um, it raises a host of difficult questions, uh, to say nothing of just the human elements of what you're talking about, the tragic side of it. Let me start by asking a question of my own. How, to what extent have you gotten to the kind of social organization of this migration? I presume that not all these people come by themselves, that they're led by coyotes or taken in groups and do, do they just get abandoned? Um, do they fall behind because they, um, you know, get weakened because of exposure or just abandoned by their group? Would you have a sense of that and how common, what the, what the range of experiences is? 
you know that's a great question and i um and first of all i just michael i want to thank you for hosting us and to, to everyone in santa fe for for all the support um you know it, it was very important for us to have our opening show in santa fe partly because you know i wrote my first book in at sar and um i just found it to be one of the most supportive kind of environments for, for this type of work so i'm just deeply appreciative of that um you know in, in terms of your question it's a there's a lot of factors that can lead to someone dying in the Arizona desert or in, in any part of the uh, the migrant trail. With the, with the Arizona desert in particular, I think because the um, conditions are so extreme, people tend to figure out the kind of limits of their body in real time. And so you could be someone who is relatively healthy, but maybe you have a, a pre-existing condition that you don't know about and then now suddenly being exposed to 100 degree temperatures for five days with little water as you're like really e exerting yourself can um can push someone to the point where they just can no longer go on um there is quite a bit of abandonment by smugglers um you will get left behind if you're too slow you'll get left behind if your group gets scattered because the border patrol comes and people move in a bunch of different directions um you know, coyotes will make decisions about who are the most valuable people in a group. And so if you're an adult who's paying half up front, maybe that, that half up front is 3,000 versus you have a, a couple of teenagers who the parents are paying 10,000, um, the smugglers will, will tend to protect those kids and, and leave behind any adults that, um, that they don't, that they see maybe as, as expendable. So there's a whole bunch of different things that, that can factor in. But I will say too that the the little bit of work that has been done on the experiences of women does highlight the fact that women tend to be abandoned more than men um and i, I think sometimes when i've interviewed women or when we've interviewed women um <clears throat> there's there there can be this sort of sexist excuse of um well women just can't handle it um that they're not strong enough to kind of do this whole thing and um and you you tend to hear that from men and from smugglers where women will say things like well you know i've given birth and i don't know i don't know a man that could that that has the gumption or the um the wherewithal to, to go through one of those things so when people talk about you know gender differences they tend to forget that um you know that uh that there are moments in life where uh where, where gender completely flips out in any other way but i but i will say that that smugglers do make decisions about who is expendable um and that's really unfortunate and i think that sexism probably does feed into that as well um but so much of it is about money i mean who is your most important cargo i mean it might be you're traveling with 10 mexican nationals five central americans and maybe two people from uh bangladesh or someplace else and the farther away you get the more um valuable those those customers become and so then smugglers make decisions about then who who's going to get left behind first mm -hmm. Um, there's a great question here from June. She says, or she asks, can you talk about the jurisdictional dynamics involved with sovereign native nations and their territory? So I assume it's uh, Tono Odham territory in some places. Um, how do you deal with that and how does that play out on the ground? That's such an important question because I think what a lot of people don't know is that the the bulk of the deaths happen on Tohono Odham land. And I mean, if you look at the death map, so I mean, the the, the Tohono O'odham Reservation is in many places very remote, difficult to access, and the Border Patrol has really tried to ex exploit that landscape, which is unfortunate. I mean, it's this sacred landscape. It's a landscape that's been the an ancestral home of Native people, and yet at the same time has been exploited by the Border Patrol um, to the point that most of the deaths happen there the tribal police and tribal government have to deal with these deaths first before it goes to the state or, or federal level um and so it ends up costing the reservation quite a bit of money um it's a very complicated issue on the res because um i think it, it can be very polarizing so, you know and, and I've, I've spoken to many Tonawatan people who who are sympathetic about this issue about you know the suffering of migrants but at the same time, you know, are, are well aware that it's it's impacting them in, in such a negative way. Um, 
and so they're, they're kind of caught between this this rock and a hard place where they they feel for the people who are suffering at the same time they're bearing the brunt of a lot of these issues and especially monetarily um but also you know culturally uh you know people who are living on the Tanajan reservation are encountering dead bodies you know they're dealing with smugglers coming through their um their backyard they're dealing with with drug smugglers and they're also dealing with the border patrol who are in many ways running rampant kind of on on the res and you know we have not done any direct research on Tonahotam land because I think it's just um it's not my place to do that to work there um I don't understand you know and I don't think I'll, I ever will understand those kind of dynamics um but I always want to highlight the fact that that they are probably out of any stakeholders along the U.S.-Mexico border, the Tohono O'odham are probably the most negatively impact people around any of these immigration issues because they are dealing with the the kind of normal immigration issues that that we deal with in San Diego, El Paso, in Aravaca, in in Nogales, but then they also are I think abused by the federal government like they have been for hundreds of years and um, and it's it's just um it's just really i don't know that's the hardest question like i never have a good answer for that other than to say that um that i wish people knew more about the the struggles that that the the teo nation has with this issue so the federal officials have untrammeled access to the reservation or are they supposed to defer to the tribal police first and how does that the, actually play out i mean theoretically there's i mean but they you know they do what they want oftentimes on on the res and the checkpoints the harassment uh the you know what people talk about migrants coming through southern arizona destroying the the natural environment uh people are leaving backpacks and water bottles and that kind of stuff and that's oftentimes a a real um, flashpoint for anti-immigrant um, rhetoric but what people don't understand is that the Border Patrol on their ATVs and then their four-wheel drive vehicles and on foot, they're out there trampling native land and destroying natural resources under the guise of homeland security. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, I think that they're in many ways not following, I mean, we, we've seen that they're not following all kinds of federal regulations uh, in regards to NAGPRA and other kinds of things. And I think it's um, really, aggravated on the res because it happens in the middle of nowhere it, there's not a lot of oversight because it just happens in a place where the, it's so hard to get to and there aren't a lot of video cameras there to to document these abuses yeah yeah it is a it's a really tough issue yeah, um moving us to a different part of the world there's a question from helen the sea has been weaponized in the mediterranean with similar prevention uh by deterrence policies can you talk about the parallels between the u.s Mexico border and the dangerous sea crossing migrants are making to reach Europe? That's a huge issue for us. I mean, it has been for a long time. I mean, trying to draw those parallels because much like in the Mediterranean, um, like if someone dies in the Arizona desert, you'll hear the border patrol say things like, well, if the desert kills you, that's kind of your fault, or it's not a border patrol issue because it, it's the natural environment doing these kinds of things. And you hear the same thing happening in the Mediterranean. And we know that different countries in the EU have been arguing over jurisdiction. So they will abandon boats out in the Mediterranean in, in hopes that a boat will float into someone else's jurisdiction. And if you happen to die someplace else, well, suddenly that's Spain's problem. And that's not um, you know, uh, Italy's problem. We see the same thing happening in Australia. I mean, Australia has probably been the most forthright in vocalizing that they view the ocean there as a natural deterrent to migration but i mean so for us i mean we, we want to to not just m have this be recognized as an arizona issue or a u.s mexico border issue but the fact that we're in the midst of a migration crisis and these different countries the um the us australia the eu we're trying to find ways to be i think more brutal in our enforcement policies, but also trying to be savvy in terms of hiding it, uh, in terms of deferring it to someone else, um, outsourcing it, and then also using it in a way that we can say, well, it's not our fault. And I, and I think with the Mediterranean that's been going on for such a long time, you know, the, the forensic architecture project that's happening in the Mediterranean, I think is really drawing attention to 
the abandonment of boats, the thousands of people who have died while crossing the Mediterranean and who have disappeared. And for us, that recognition was part of our rationale for making our first show in Europe be in Lampedusa, which is a place where thousands of people have died trying to get there. And yet you don't see the evidence because people just drown and disappear. And we really want to um, to stand in solidarity with those with with those migrants and those refugees so that we can, you know, highlight the fact that this can't be something that we can um, think about. It's, it's like someone else's problem. I mean, for us, it's a it's a global issue. And the global reaction in terms of enforcement, which I find to be equally problematic around the globe, is something also that we, that we really want to raise awareness about. Mm -hmm. And isn't it the case that this is really just the le leading edge of a bigger problem that climate change is going to be generating? It already is in some parts of the world. People hate that that argument. I've heard that some people will they say, well, nothing to do with climate change. You know, um, it's about this is a Mexico problem or a Honduras problem. And unfortunately, I mean all these things are they're linked together. And as climate changes, as as Mexico experiences more droughts, as Honduras experiences more extreme flooding, as Africa experiences all these these um these extreme uh, climatic events we're only going to see this more and more. I mean, and I feel like right now we're living in, um, you know, the the, the book uh, Children of Men or the movie Children of Men, where major catastrophes are happening globally and people are having to leave their homes. And like as as humans have done since the beginning of our history, we we flee, we run, we move, we migrate to find a place where we can better survive and. Um, you know, people who want to ignore the migration issue, it's like, well, can can you, you can ignore that maybe, but then can you still ignore the the climate change issue? And maybe there's some people who want to put their head in the sand about, about, about both of those things, but um, they're intimately linked. And if you don't believe in one, one of the one or the other is going to come to to bite you in the backside sooner or later, as a, a you know wherever you live. Yeah. Um, Guadalupe has a question. Can, uh, can you explain this idea that undocumented migrants' lives are considered expendable? What's the role of the media and political discourses in sort of creating that image? It, well, and I have a follow-up question, but why don't you why don't you grab this first? You know, I think that's that's such an important question because um, I feel like for the last ten years, I've I've been writing or working in a in an environment where for the longest time the expectation is like as someone who writes about these issues I have to kind of justify the existence of of undocumented people like you know when people say oh he's writing a book that's like humanizing migrants or humanizing undocumented people and I find that to be so problematic because they in fact are human and and yet we're still at we're still kind of spinning this as like this person is trying to humanize these humans and and I think that's just part of a, a larger global problem where depending on where you're sitting um, and depending on your legal status you might not ever think about undocumented people as being human at all and as being people who can live in statistics who you know maybe 3,200 dead people is not something that you're concerned about or um, you know, you don't think about those issues and as as affecting you or as being relatable. And I do think that in well, and in the in the U.S., we know that. I mean, especially right now, we we think about undocumented people as a whole. And I always say we, and people get weirded out when I say we. And I, I say we because I'm a tax-paying U.S. citizen who is part of this system. And whether I want to believe it or not. Um, I'm complacent in some of the stuff because of the taxes I pay and because of the institutions that I support. But I, I don't think that um, that many Americans really think about undocumented people as humans, as people who are valuable, who are whose lives are as interesting or as important as as their own. And and I think the federal government has long had that stance because if we look at the way we treat them, we look at how we treat whether they're even our most treasured undocumented people and those most treasured, you know, the, our DACA folks um, who I think occupy 
like if, if even if you're they kind of occupy this position where um they're the, like the most noble of the migrants and and i think that's so unfortunate because i think all people should be recognized as being valuable um regardless of immigration status and um but you know i, I think within the, within the us we tend to um put a value judgment on, on these different lives and there are sure i mean there are thousands if not millions of people in this country that we don't think as 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 being important contribution contributors to the to american society and we, we see that in the way in which we demonize them because of language we try to defund them in other kinds of ways um we argue that they're stealing our jobs all these things and even though we know that deep down they're crucial contributors to the society and yet we still um talk about them as if they're not fully human so my follow-up to guadalupe's question and you and i talked about this a little bit uh in advance of this presentation um sar got a bit of um hostile trolling uh, through social media and uh, very hateful messages not all of them but but some and um and obviously you i would imagine that you've experienced a lot more of that so how do you respond to those kinds of things or do you respond is it is it pointless to respond what's your thinking about that jason i think it's important to think about and to engage with i i, I don't necessarily try to respond to all of it um because I think there are some people that can't be reached and by can't being reached is there's nothing that I can say that will allow someone to see beyond the categories of like legal or illegal. Like we, like they can't see the, the value in human life just because it's a human life. And I think for a long time I was, I, I worked really hard to, I always wanted to engage. And, and talk to people about that because I felt like I could help with that. But I've kind of come to learn like, that's like your mom's job. And I always say mom, because I'm a single, I grew up just with my mom. And so she was my mom, my dad, my grandma, my grandpa, she was my role model for everything. And I think if, if you don't, if you can't learn the kind of basics of that, everyone should be given some consideration of like a value, then I can't, I can't get into that argument. Um, but I will say with other folks, you know, who who want to argue about these things, it's it's important to just get educated. And I think that a lot of times we have these gut reactions to these things like, well, illegal is illegal and legal is legal. And and I think when, when people respond to me with, with a lot of hate, which they often do, and and I'm you can't do this work without dealing with it all the time i always just want to understand like what is your anxiety what is leading to this kind of hatred um because i, I try to live a life where, where i have no hate in my heart even though i get angry about a lot of things um i don't want to live a life where i'm just i'm I, I could never hate someone else for these for for reasons that were outside of their control and so i you know people who who respond like so negatively my first question is always like, what is it that you're really mad about? Are you mad about like illegals or, or as someone as have you been like screwed over economically? And if so, or politically or culturally or and if so, like. Let's think about who, who are the scapegoats for that and then start to kind of unpack that. And I think at the end of the day, what I really want people to do with this work is I don't ever want to change their mind. I want them to just learn more engage with this issue in perhaps a different kind of way and then they can walk away from a, a toe tag wall of 3200 names they can maybe spend 20 minutes filling out toe tags and then they can walk away and they can still hate migrants they can still hate um you know what's going on at the u.s mexico border but maybe they know a little bit more and i would hope that with that they can at least think deeper about the, that issue beyond maybe what they've heard in some kind of news story. Uh, but I do try to, I mean, I really try to engage because I feel like my job is very easy to to talk to the choir. I mean, that's like, that's, that's not a hard job. Um, but I don't think that that's really where we should be in this moment. I, I really want us to, to try to, to have a different kind of dialogue. 
and it doesn't have to be a, a, a pleasant dialogue, but I would hope it, it would at least be a, a civil dialogue with people who are open to, to hearing something new. Well, thank you. I think on that note, um, we probably should wrap here. We've gone over the top of the hour. Let me thank you for your contribution and also um, thank Site Santa Fe and, and the CCA, Center for Contemporary Arts, just because this has been a really enjoyable collaboration. And also, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed and inspired by the work of so many people to pivot from what we thought we'd be doing uh, and what we've been doing in the face of um, you know this national disaster, which is really what the COVID-19 um, pandemic is. Um, and I also want to let our participants just know, just remind them that uh, tomorrow you will be in dialogue with another MacArthur Fellow, Steve Feld, um, very different kind of scholar in some ways, though both of you have media experience and the focus will be on how you turn your academic work into something that's more accessible to uh, the general public. Both of, both of you are great su successes at that. So that's 3 p.m. Mountain Time tomorrow, and you need to register. You can do that at the SAR website, sarweb.org. Again, Jason, thank you very much, and thanks to everybody who, who uh, checked in on this. Michael, thank you all, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>